Welcome, 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 everybody, to the Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. We're in our lovely downtown Manhattan studios. Week 10 of the NFL, week 11 in college football. There's a saying that Scott Hansen says on the NFL Red Zone, right about going into the fourth quarter. He calls it the witching hour, okay, where losses become wins and wins become losses. Week 10 in the NFL for me was a witching hour of itself. There were opportunities for teams to win. And when I say win, I mean extend what they're doing, going towards the mountaintop. But week 10 turned into be a place where wins become losses. And the hierarchy of what we thought we knew versus what is, I think, came to fruition a little bit more. Um, and, uh, and if the playoffs would have, if the playoffs um, started right now in the AFC, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Buffalo Bills would be out. Those were two teams that are expected to be in that playoff hunt, in that Super Bowl hunt in the AFC for the next 10 years. Hey, there's seven games left. There's a lot to happen, but each and every week as we compartmentalize and we get to understand a little bit more about each and every team and what that looks like, some have come and risen to the top. Um, and we'll see where it plays out from here. But uh, there was a lot of great football. There was a lot of matchups that we were looking forward to. There was a lot. Of, listen to this. We lost every game in the early window, and we won every game in the afternoon and night window. So, you know, figure that one out. Um, we are sitting at six and six and two on the weekend, um, waiting for tonight's matchup between the Buffalo Bills and the Denver Broncos. We'll get into that game and preview it a little bit later, but let's recap everything that went down this weekend in the NFL. We'll start with Sunday night football. The New York Jets traveling to the Las Vegas Raiders, the Raiders for the second consecutive week under new interim head coach Antonio Pierce. Um, could he take down both New York franchises in back-to-back -back weeks? Zach Wilson uh, got a vote of confidence again from Robert Sala. I made a statement on Sunday around what that locker room has to feel like because, listen, I was in Zach Wilson's shoes. We had the number one defense in San Diego, okay, led by Rodney Harrison and Junior Seau. They were terrific. We had the number one defense in the NFL, and uh, – and I was playing very similarly to, to Zach Wilson, where we could not get in the end zone. Um, we got in more than, than what the Jets are, because we could run it a little bit better, uh, apparently. But the locker room, uh, because of my behavior, w fractured. That hasn't happened here in New York, okay? People like Zach Wilson. And that's surprising after how he was responded to after he didn't take accountability last year and the team was wearing t-shirts around that had Mike White on them all those things the outward affection to Aaron Rodgers when he was signed this offseason to then be thrust into action they have seen a significant change in his behavior his work ethic all the things that go into it. there is no way Robert Sala and ownership are willing to fracture that locker room if that locker room isn't behind with behind Zach Wilson and behind the decision to do it. The guy leading the, the charge there is Aaron Rodgers, don't get me wrong. And this Jets team certainly follows its, um, uh, you know, it, its line from Aaron Rodgers, period. Having said all that, you have, to, you have to show up on the field. And he may have played one of his better games last night in terms of, I think, efficiency, um, but once again, Nathaniel Hackett uh, just can't hack it. Calling plays, especially in the red zone, multiple times. This is two consecutive weeks where they have not scored a touchdown. The Raiders get the win 16-12. to The only touchdown scored, rookie to rookie. Aiden O'Connell getting his second start, or third start, I think, um, threw a nice little uh, uh, shot over the top of the defender. And Mike Mayer, the tight end rookie out of Notre Dame, goes up and gets a great catch. Defense played well. Max Crosby, though he didn't get a sack, he was wrecking havoc once again. 
Uh, the Jets outgained the Raiders. Uh, they just simply couldn't get in the end zone. Four field goals, ultimately a soul-crushing interception by Zach Wilson, by uh, Spillane. Now, Antonio Pierce talked about really enabling and advocating for the players on this team. Josh Jacobs was going to be the answer on the offensive side of the football. He was going to get carries. And then you had Robert Spillane on the defensive side. And you would think you'd look at Max Crosby or maybe somebody in the back. No. They were going to build around this linebacker, a guy that seemed to be around the, play, around the ball all the time. His time in Pittsburgh and now here in Las Vegas. And he did. He made the biggest play of the night, got the interception, and then the defense shuts down a Hail Mary uh, to send New York packing. Um, Antonio Pierce is going to be able to go into the offseason with that uh, to ho- hang over everybody's head. Uh, this team seems uh, joyous, I think is the way to put it. And um, that's because of Antonio Pierce and how he has brought his fire, uh, his advocation for his players to the forefront. Simple. Simple as that can be. And it's just something that Josh McDaniels couldn't do. He is locked in the, uh, you know, the old rhetoric of the Bill Belichick coaching process and logic. And that just that's not going to work in this day, day and age of the NFL. A lot of guys you're seeing have success are former players. And former players in my generation, like Dan Campbell, who I played with in Dallas, and Antonio Pierce, who I played against uh, in New York. So it, they know how to coach these guys up, and that is the understanding to empower the men in the locker room because those are the ones that are going to win the game on the field. And, uh, and that's what he's done. And now they're 2-0 and as him. And now they're at 5-5, five and five too. I mean, they're one game behind the Kansas City Chiefs, if you can believe that. Today, though, Sauce Gardner came out and said what I think a lot of people um, were thinking. And I felt the locker room had stayed pretty tightly knit uh, as it was, but he said that, that they're not playing complimentary football. He didn't call out the offense necessarily, but you can read between the lines there, uh, something that Robert Sala hasn't been willing to say. Bottom line, offense ain't pulling its weight, especially inside the 20-yard line um, and getting in the end zone. I think one of the easiest prop bets last night certainly was uh, Zach Wilson under one and a half passing touchdowns. Um, that may be one that you could take for like a four-game stretch. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how much this affects the defense, how this affects the team moving forward. You have um, um, you have Boyles uh, as well as Simeon there backing up. Um, but it sounds like Zach Wilson is going to continue to go. And like you heard me on Friday, it wasn't like I think he's playing that poorly. It was one of his better games. Just a big mistake, um, not hitting the easy things. Oh, I do want to comment, too, on, on the, the talent offensively. Brees Hall is, is incredibly talented, but, you know, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hackett doesn't use him the right way in terms of how they rush him, um, you know, and doesn't get him enough touches in the passing game either. But Garrett Wilson is going to be a star, okay? And, I, and I'm going to say going to be because even in this matchup, when you have the likes of Devontae Adams and you look at CeeDee Lamb, who we'll talk about a little bit later, doesn't matter. Easy catches, they make those catches, okay? And that's the one thing that Garrett Wilson hasn't necessarily been able to do. In those big moments where you got to have the catch and it's right on your hands, he still drops it. And uh, uh, I know you can't expect him to be the one-man show there, but when you are wide receiver one, you have to get that. And just the offense is not playing together well enough uh, for this team to win. And uh, um, Miami and, and Buffalo seemingly now can kind of start to distance themselves in this division. And that under for the New York Jets win total that we took preseason starting to look very, very nice. Another huge game out in Jacksonville. The 49ers coming off a bye week and three consecutive losses versus a Jacksonville Jaguars team also coming off a bye week, coming off five consecutive wins. You know, we drank the Kool-Aid in Jacksonville. Duval County uh, has some uh, toxic water that we drank or something. We went Jags plus the three in this one. We, I, I couldn't believe that they were 
a dog at home with all those things. But what this game was an example of was exactly what is and what still isn't in the NFL hierarchy. I talked about that. Jags fans did not like that at all. 34-3 to you get beat. It was not even competitive. This was a playoff game. This was a week off. If you were the two seed, you get that week, or if you're the one seed, you get that week off. And this is how you would play at home hosting a playoff game? It just shows far and away how superior that the 49ers still are than the likes of the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jags, are they still going to win the division? Maybe. We're going to dive into that a little bit later in the show. But, I mean, it was awful. It didn't even look like the guys wanted to play. I think, I think that might be the better one. They looked out of place. They looked like the moment was too big. And where San Francisco didn't look like that at all. And guess what? They got all their guys back. Trent Williams was back. Debo was back. Christian looked healthy, uh, though he did have his touchdown, uh, anytime touchdown uh, streak snapped, though San Francisco tried to get it. Uh, on those final few snaps near the goal line at the end of the game. 34-3. to Don't want to overreact, but it is overreaction Monday, and I'm going to overreact. That is embarrassing, Jags. Embarrassing. That's like Seattle at Baltimore. That's like Detroit at Baltimore. Amazing. Except it's at home where you have to win. You have to show out better than that. That was some ugly, ugly football, folks. 49ers get the win coming off the bye. Jags now having to figure things out. Luckily, they live in a division that uh, allows for, for them to rebound pretty darn quickly. Let's head to Baltimore, where uh, the Baltimore Ravens once again got out to a big lead over their division rival, the Cleveland Browns. And just like every other time in the last few weeks, I expected Baltimore to put their um, boot on their neck and go. But the three losses now that they have experienced this year have all been come from behind. They had the Seattle, they had the Pittsburgh Steelers dead to rights. In fact, that game could have been a 17 to 24 uh, shellacking. Instead, they get beat. And sure enough, Cleveland figures it out. Deshaun Watson started utilizing Amari Cooper. Uh, and this team on the defensive side of the football gets some big turnovers. Uh, they got Lamar to uh, throw two interceptions, one of them a pick six that ultimately got him back in the, in the mix. They missed the extra point, still had a chance to win the game, had to punt it away, and Deshaun gets this team into field goal range, uh, and they win the game. Um, I don't know if uh, P.J. Walker is able to make the run that gets them into Baltimore territory, but it's a big win for Cleveland, big win for Cleveland, and everybody accordion-wise – comes back in the AFC North. In fact, the Steelers next week uh, could be in first place um, uh, if they get a win, if you can believe that. That's, that's some impressive sauce there in Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, the Browns get it done. The Browns rally. There's a stat that came out today, and I want to make sure I get this one right. Uh, it sits at this, okay? Um, this is – through the first 10 games of a season, over the last 40 years, the top five teams in terms of least time trailing, okay? So the first 10 games of a season, the teams that have had, had the least times trailing in any game, that means they've been pretty dominant uh, in the first 10 games. The number one team is the, is the 84 Miami Dolphins. That's Dan Marino and that crew. Only 14 minutes. What's the record? 10-0. The Denver Broncos, 1998 Super Bowl champs, 27 minutes of time trailing, 10 and 0 at that point. The 1990 New York Jets or New York Giants, 43 minutes, 10 and 0. And the 2007 New England Patriots, 51 minutes, and they were 10 and 0. The Baltimore Ravens, third on that list, 28.46 seconds. Seven and three. The only team in all those iconic teams, the only team with a loss is Baltimore because they have not been able to close them when they needed to. 
They've looked like world beaters, and then they got their worlds beat, period. Uh, I was pretty hard on Rashad Bateman on a go route uh, where it looked like he just kept running. I don't know if he saw the ball. Uh, I, I mentioned he had to turn into a, a, a DB there and knock that ball away, or at least try to. Uh, it's a poor throw, poor communication. Either way, you know, you can't make those types of mistakes if you're Lamar Jackson, period. Uh, for as good as he's been uh, in the losses in which they've gotten beat this year, he has, you know, looked just as bad. And that's why they lose. As far as Lamar Jackson goes is as far as this team goes. Uh, and he needs, to be, he needs to be better every single week. We'll see what plays out on a short week when they take on the Bengals. Speaking of the Bengals, um, they hosted upstart – uh, C.J. Stroud and the Houston Texans. Um, I talked about this on Good Morning Football this week. After the record-setting performance by C.J. Stroud and the comeback victory over the Bucks, uh, I wanted D'Amico Ryans to have a conversation with him about how to prepare for this game. And the preparation mode I wanted him in was playoff mode. I wanted this to feel like a playoff atmosphere. They were going up against a team that played in the back-to-back -back AFC championships, had gone to the Super Bowl in one of those years. This was a playoff caliber team, and they were playing like it. And Joe Burrow is an MVP caliber quarterback. Defense he was going to see was going to look much different um, in terms of what he's seen all year long. And it was imperative to do that. They were going to be at, without his new favorite weapon and Nico Collins in this game. So you had to figure something out. And you got to give the Houston Texans a ton of credit. They schemed up an offense that was very good. The defense is what I was most impressed with. They, they made Joe Burrow look average, and they got after him. And this uh, offensive line, once again, simply cannot get it done when they need to. They leave their quarterback too exposed, as they have ever since he's joined this team. And they found ways to get to the Super Bowl and the AFC Championship. But uh, they're not physical enough to take on what's ahead of them and what's coming in January, right? They're not going to play Derek Carr and the Raiders and then Ryan Tannehill and the Tennessee Titans to get to the AFC Championship. There's not going to be those quarterbacks in the playoffs this year. One of them could be C.J. Stroud. This young rookie has been phenomenal. And once again, he leads his team on a game-winning drive where they kick the field goal to ultimately win it. Dalton Schultz has been an incredible pickup for this Houston Texans team. He has looked long and rangy, and even on the final drive on one of the biggest catches of the game, he's up against Cam Taylor Britt, their best corner, and he's able to get the win and make the catch. Uh, C.J. Stroud throws only his second interception of the season. It was a bad one because it was late, and it got Cincinnati back in the game. Tyler Boyd, who had a great game and had to step up big because T. Higgins was out and Jamar Chase was a little bit limited, had a chance in regulation to put them up by four, um, but he dropped a pass in the end zone from Joe Burrow, giving uh, this uh, Houston Texans team a chance to uh, win with the field goal. And that's exactly what they did. Um, there's been a bunch of people, ESPN most uh, importantly, um, and you know how I feel about ESPN, um, they uh, are all in on C.J. Stroud as a MVP candidate. Okay. He's playing incredibly inspired good football in back-to-back -back weeks, uh, winning against a playoff-caliber team and not-so-playoff-caliber team. But just the week before, they lost to the Carolina Panthers, okay? They lost to the Panthers, who hadn't had a win all season long until that point. So let's just, you know, hold our horses. He's playing incredibly well. It's a quarterback award. If this team is able to do the things they, they need to do down the stretch, win the division, by all means. Because if they win the division, that means C.J. Stroud has played pretty, pretty solid football the rest of the way through. And if he's sitting there in a place where he's got two, three interceptions and 30 touchdowns, yeah, I'd have to I'd have to have start having that conversation, um, but right now we don't know. We still don't know. It's so week to week. Let's not go all in on it. Um, and you know how I feel about C.J. Stroud and what we thought of him here on the show heading into the draft. 
Uh, exciting, exciting times for the young player. Uh, the best thing in all of this, though, was was really D'Amico Ryan's and getting that defense to play the, the way that they did. Uh, it was inspired uh, football on their part, and they're young and they're uh, wild and free, and they don't they don't know what they don't know. They're just they're just out there having fun and flying around, and that's what they did, uh, and they got it done on the road in Cincinnati. Uh, when they were up by 10 and lost that lead, and then to finish it in the fashion in which they did, well done, Houston Texans. Um, you, now, you now, in my eyes, have every shot at winning your division with the way you're playing. Uh, you already have a win on the road at Jacksonville in the head-to-head. You just got to keep it up and can't have you know, losses, inexplicable losses to teams like the Carolina Panthers uh, all the way through. This was a big game. The Los Angeles Chargers had every opportunity to make a statement. Two um, physically um, overpowering wins over the Bears and the Jets. Defensive performances, too. And um, that made me feel like Brandon Staley had gotten his guys uh, in a different kind of mindset. Uh, and then in walks the Detroit Lions. And that Alps absolutely evaporate, evaporated immediately. This defense for the, for the uh, Los Angeles Chargers did not touch Jared Goff. Didn't touch him. Let him do whatever the hell they wanted offensively. The offensive line dominated a defensive line that made the Jets uh, look like a JV squad. They ran the ball. They threw the ball, both running backs over 100 yards rushing in this game. I think it was 500-plus yards of total offense. Uh, I don't know when the Chargers stopped them. But on the other side of that coin, Justin Herbert and this offense may have had their best football game uh, maybe in Justin Herbert's career. I mean, they were special offensively. The one thing I would do if I was Kellen Moore, stop running the quarterback sneak. You are the worst at running the quarterback sneak. You are the worst at running a, uh, you know, goal line plays from the one yard line than anybody. All right, stop banging your head against the wall. You are much more inventive. You can figure out different ways to get in the end zone. I I can't complain about it because at the end of every one of those drives, they scored points. They got the points. They were in the game, 38-38 at the end, and then, you know. The Lions just mowed them down through the air, um, play fakes over the top, running the football on fourth and two to get them into a better field goal uh, percentage uh, spot as as well as running the clock all the way out, not even allowing Justin Herbert and the team to have another opportunity. Uh, Great win. Great win for the Detroit Lions. And now they're sitting at that eight and two. Have to be feeling pretty good about themselves now with um, they have three, three wins over the AFC West now. They have a win over the Chiefs, the Raiders, and now the Chargers. Their lone game left against – the division is against the Broncos. I'm assuming that is in Detroit. So um, Detroit has firm them, firmly put themselves in a place where they could be uh, the one or two seed. And that means opportunities to host – playoff games in Detroit, which I think would go a long way. I don't know about the pressure that that comes with that, but Dan Campbell certainly has his team playing at a very, very high level. As for the Chargers, this lays at the feet of Brandon Staley for as much as we complimented him over the last two weeks. Also, it's a referendum on the offenses of the Bears and the Jets, and I guess we should know that. Um but we got proven really wrong in this game. And Brandon Staley just got outcoached, plain and simple, by Ben Johnson, the offensive coordinator for the Lions. They had no answer, absolutely no answer. First play on that final drive, wide open, wide open uh, on a crossing route to Raymond, who took it for like 40 yards into Chargers territory, and it was over. It was just over. Could not get pressure on the quarterback, Panay Sewell, I know that everybody's still going to think I sound uh, hilarious here, but I still think, for the love of Joe Burrow, that Panay Sewell was still the draft pick there instead of Jamar Chase. 
You're not going to convince me otherwise. I do believe they win the Super Bowl with Panay there rather than Jamar Chase, but I know the Lions love it, and this offense is starting to churn it out. Let's go to Minnesota. Josh Dobbs, finally a week with the team. This feel-good story can't continue, can it? Right? It just it can't. There's too much there. You have the New Orleans Saints coming to town, seemingly found themselves on offense a little bit, but the defense has always been great, leading the league in turnovers. They'll get Josh Dobbs, who doesn't know the offense very well, who have now had a week to kind of study him a little bit, to make a few mistakes, get some turnovers, and, and ultimately put this feel-good story to bed. Well, that didn't happen. Josh Dobbs was awesome. This team put together a game plan offensively that decimated that defense. They just ran around. And Josh Dobbs gives this team a different bit of a different dynamic in terms of offense because he can use his legs in different ways that Kirk Cousins simply can't. You know, uh, Hawkinson balled out. Jordan Addison has continued to uh, improve and get better and be a guy. And they've done all of this without Justin Jefferson. Five consecutive wins. This team's at six and four. They're right behind the Detroit Lions. Okay. Kevin O'Connell very much is in the running for, for coach of the year of the way it started and how, in, how and how to redirect that ship. As for the Saints, they lose Derek Carr to injury. Jameis Winston comes in, gets the team back with a couple touchdown passes, but then inexplicably in a play where you do not need to go down the field, throws into double coverage, inter- gets the ball intercepted, game over. And uh, it's been the story of the year. This New Orleans Saints team, uh, has had every opportunity, the schedule, um, the skill position players, and they just have not lived up to it, and, and that's the bottom line. Um, should have totally owned this division, and now um, you just never know what you're going to get from this team week to week. Uh, you certainly know what you're going to get from the uh, Minnesota Vikings. They are um, playing with a lot of heart right now. That defense, uh, for, a one, for a defense that got gutted over the offseason, Brian Flores has brought a team together. Hunter leading in with the, the sack end. And on the back end, Harrison Smith, who was contemplating retirement this offseason, comes back and has almost been rejuvenated a little bit. I mean, he is playing with a ton of passion, and it's been fun to watch. Let's go to Dallas, where the New York Giants. I'd said that the, the Cowboys could hang 50 on them. They ended up hanging 49. 49 to 17, dominating uh, game for the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, against bad squads, this Dallas Cowboys team is undefeated. You know, they are unmatched. Uh, 89 to 17, the Giants have been outscored this year by the Dallas Cowboys. Tommy DeVito making his first start, the New Jersey native uh, who still lives with his parents, went out through two touchdown passes. I mean, that's, that's, that's a story. Tommy DeVito's not going to be a quarterback in this league, okay? Th- that's, that's okay. He could be a backup forever. But then to have this story, I mean, it's a great story for him. This team got dominated. Uh, we, even seen, we even saw Brian Dable and Wink Martindale going at it a little bit on the sideline. The offensive line could not protect Tommy DeVito. The defense just kept getting burned and run through. And Dallas looked really good, okay? I'm even cheerleading them today. I got the Cowboys – gear on, you know, rolling through New York City, kind of saying, Giants, what's up, you know? Bottom line is, with this Cowboys team, and it's been the storyline for the last few years, is that as good as they are, can they beat the top teams in the league? Well, they've proven this year losing badly to the 49ers, and then, you know, pretty competitive, but then stumbling and and figuring ways to lose the game to the Eagles, um, there's no way I see the Cowboys going on the road to Philadelphia or San Francisco in the playoffs and getting a win. They have to host. And they seemingly feel like they're out of that conversation. They most likely are going to be the fifth seed once again, which means they have to go on the road. Um, Immediately, they have to go immediately on the road to play a divisional champion, which could be good for them like they did last year at Tampa. They probably could go to, I don't know, New Orleans or, um, uh, yeah, probably would be New Orleans in this Saint or Tampa, ultimately whoever wins the South there. Um, but I just, I, I can't see them 
you know, making a run for a Super Bowl simply because of their inability to beat the better teams. Um, they also have a loss to the Cardinals, too, or they didn't show up for that one. So it is what it is. We'll see what it looks like when Philly comes down to Dallas here on the back half of the season. But the Cowboys get a win. Dak Prescott uh, counts for five touchdowns. CeeDee Lamb uh, is the only receiver, I think, in three consecutive games to go 10-plus catches and 150-plus yards in receiving. Dude was spectacular once again. Uh, he's about to get paid next offseason. Number 88 is going to be there for a long time. And I would argue it will be the highest paid wide receiver in all of football um, next year when Jerry Jones gives him that contract. Kyler Murray returns for the Arizona Cardinals. The reason why Josh Dobbs was moved out of Arizona to allow for the quarterback, the franchise quarterback, to have his say in what this season ultimately turns into and whether or not he's the answer. I was really interested to see how he would perform in an offense for the first time since I don't know when, years in college, where he wasn't running an air raid sort of offense. Cliff Kingsbury during his tenure there, that's all they ran. And then uh, Kyler got injured last year with an ACL, and this was his first game back. We went uh, alternate passing yards here of 225 plus. He exceeded that by a bunch for a good payday. And then this team hung in there. The defense played inspired. Uh, the Atlanta Falcons sputtered on offense with Taylor Heineke. He goes out. Desmond Ritter comes in. Uh, Bijan Robinson gets more carries. Desmond Ritter gets him into the end zone, gets him the lead, and then Kyler Murray does and, and performs his magic act. There was a point where he ran probably 50 yards to get 30 uh, to put them in a position uh, to kick a field goal uh, to win this game, and uh, they do. They get their second win of the season, the 25-23 to victory over the Atlanta Falcons, who fall to 4-6, and six, seemingly can't get out of their own way. Uh, there's no reason why this team should not be above 500. In fact, there's no reason why this team shouldn't be leading division. A lot of football to play left, seven games, but, you know, Arthur Smith, uh, uh, you know, can't, can't quite get it right. And uh, it's going to continue to be awkward in Atlanta if they keep losing these types of games. Let's head to Seattle, where the Washington Commanders uh, visited with Sam, Ho uh, Sam Howell and that, you know, revamped defense. Uh, and the Seattle Seahawks, you know, coming off that embarrassing loss to the, the Detroit Lions. Uh, didn't stop this game from being, you know, you know, putting up a bunch of fireworks. I'm going to start by saying this. Eric Bieniemy. this is absolutely a referendum on his ability to coach and bring talent out of people because of his tenure in Kansas City. They are not the same type of Kansas City team offensively and Patrick Mahomes hasn't been the same quarterback uh, that he had been under Eric Bieniemy, And I think, uh, you know, every writer out there and every person who threw mud uh, at Eric Bieniemy and his lack of uh, play calling abilities into scheme and offense needs to take a lap on that one because what he's been able to do for Sam Howell, dude is good, and he lets it fly. Uh, and Eric, he encourages that, and he did it in this game. Their skill position players and Brian Robinson Jr., they're impressive, impressive football players, and they made this game highly entertaining. Washington ties it up late. Geno Smith takes them down the field, 369-yard passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions, both Zach Charbonnet and Kenneth Walker. They go for big days as well ultimately getting them into a, a position with a walk-off field goal to win it 29-26 to stay uh, even with the San Francisco 49ers in the NFC West. So Seattle gets the win. Washington drops, but they are so darn competitive. But I don't know if it's going to be enough. They're not going to be able to win the division. Most likely they'd have to find a way to sneak in uh, as a wild-card team, but I don't know if the NFC East is going to get in uh, three teams. Um, we'll see because that place is Jack Del Rio – and Ron Rivera, I think, in some peril. I don't think it does for Eric Bieniemy. In fact, like we said before the year started, with new ownership, um, Eric Bieniemy may be the answer. He may be the answer in the room uh, and where they need to go. I don't know if you make him the head coach. Um, he's a great offensive coordinator, though. Plain and simple. Great offensive coordinator. 
Frankfurt, Germany for the final international football, uh, football matchup uh, this year uh, for the NFL. Pitted against uh, two teams that for, the, for decades between Tom Brady and Peyton Manning were just unbelievable football games. And uh, this one turned into a snooze fest. Uh, we took the under on this one, and boy, were we right. Gardner Minshew, uh, Jonathan Taylor, um, they just did enough. And the New England Patriots did just enough to lose it, too. Mac Jones throws a bad pick. Had been 15 of 19 up to that point. Throws a terrible interception in the red zone where if he would have just put more air under it, it would have gone to Gesicki for a touchdown that ultimately may have won them the game. Instead, uh, Indianapolis finds a way to burn a bunch of clock, punt it away, and give New England the ball back uh, 85 yards away with no timeouts. And before you know it, you see Bailey Zappi running onto the field. And uh, Bill Belichick had benched Mac Jones. And you throw in a guy that probably was colder than cold, having not probably practiced or played or sat on a plane, all of it, and asked him to take his team down the field and win it. And uh, exactly like everybody assumed it would play out, Bailey Zappi threw an interception because of the miscommunication between the receiver and the quarterback. Uh, the Patriots fall to two and eight. Their two wins, by the way, are over the Bills and the Jets. Divisional football uh, is so, so crazy. It, it just is so chaotic. These teams know each other so well, and Bill Belichick certainly in that sense. Now, the bigger question is, Robert Kraft commented before the game about how he'd never been 2-7. and seven. But Rich Eisen, who was uh, conducting the interview at the time, didn't ask the question. Didn't ask the question, hey, is Bill Belichick's job in jeopardy? And uh, I would have liked to hear that. Uh, there's been some chatter out there that he's talked about. No, his job's fine. You know, he was extended during the offseason. Now, you guys know my uh, position on this. I feel like the extension was, in sense, a lifetime achievement award. Like, hey, if you're able to turn this thing around, great. Now we've got you extended and we've got you for a long time. But if you can't, that was the, here you go. Thank you for everything you've done for us. I remind you of the Jerry Jones situation in Dallas. He buys the team. He's a new owner. The legendary Tom Landry goes 3-13, and 13 and he has to show him the door. Robert Kraft has owned this team for a long, long time. He's been with Bill Belichick for a long, long time. Is he able to show the door to the greatest head football coach about 20, what, five wins away from being the all-time winningest coaches? Um, if he were to go 3-14 and 14 or 2-15, and 15, is that a possibility? I think it's a real conversation you have to have. Uh, the New England Patriots became a dynasty large in part because of Bill Belichick, but because of the players they played put there. Just now, uh, coming over the wire, uh, their cornerback, Jones, was waived. He was from their 2022 draft, which I think has one player that really contributes, and that's Cole Strange, the one pick that everybody thought would uh, was a reach. Um, but uh, uh, there was a lot of things going behind the scenes. J.C. Jackson was not asked to come along on the trip to Frankfurt, Germany, so... I've never seen a, a, a Patriots team crumble like this, especially one coached under Bill Belichick. And it just it shows you how times are changing. Uh, the Colts get another win, and they go to five wins in a division now that uh, Jacksonville has come back to. Houston's there, Indy's there, and Jacksonville. Getting kind of interesting now uh, in that division. We'll see how it plays out. My Pittsburgh Steelers, we went with a Jalen Warren over – I think it was like 30, 33 yards rushing. Well, he went over 100 yards rushing, people. This combo of Jalen Warren and Najee Harris has really started to produce. Uh, Kenny Pickett got out to a good quick start, um, and the defense once again shines. They get uh, Green Bay to turn it over twice late in the football game and ultimately pull away with a four-point win. Um uh, there was a controversy, uh, a controversial call by the officials on what really seemed like a backwards pass that called it, that got called an incomplete one instead of a fumble that was recovered by Green Bay that could have tipped the balance in Green Bay's favor. But nonetheless, uh, the Packers once again play a tight football game and find a way to lose. I do think that the Packers have their quarterback. 
wins were not consequential for Aaron Rodgers in that year where they went 6-10. and 10. They found out he was the next guy. And I think what we've seen over the past few weeks in this season from Jordan Love, he is their guy. He just needs better, more mature um, players around him to continue to make him blossom. But I do think they found their guy in Jordan Love. It's just going to be a tough year for them to navigate it. And I had to ask the question whether or not he would have the same, you know, lead time as Aaron Rodgers did if he were to go 6-11 and 11 or 7-10. and 10. I didn't think he would. And uh, uh, as long as the team and the organization feel that way, um, I expect to see Jordan Love in a Green Bay Packers uniform for some time now um, being their quarterback. Pittsburgh gets the win and gets one game closer to the division lead with Cincinnati and Baltimore playing. If Cincinnati is able to get the upset and win over Baltimore, guess what? Pittsburgh is tied for first place and with the head-to-head against Baltimore is the division leader. Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers coming off consecutive losses in a heartbreaking one to the Houston Texans last week take on the Tennessee Titans where Will Levis has been named the starter for the remainder of the year. I like the Titans in this one. I thought the defense for Tampa Bay had been gutted over the last few weeks, and that would present problems for them with Will Levis and DeAndre Hopkins and Derrick Henry. Not so fast, my friends. Uh, The Bucs defense showed up. I mean, they pressured Will Levis. They met him make mistakes. And once again, he throws an interception late in the game that ends the game. Baker Mayfield revving it up with these guys. Mike Evans goes over 100 yards and a touchdown. Um... And, and they keep churning. They keep churning. It's a bad division. Don't get me wrong. The NFC South is a bad division. Uh, who's going to come away with it? You know, it seems to be back and forth. Atlanta wants it, but they don't want it. New Orleans wants it. No, they don't. Tampa Bay, you want it? Yeah, no. You know, we just, we don't know. We know Carolina's not going to be in the mix in this one. But they get the win. Tennessee, uh, should have known better, Ryan, is the best way to put it. I should have known better. They have been god-awful on the road all year long. Go look. They have been terrible. Only the Thursday night game uh, uh, 10 days ago where they lost on the final play of the game uh, to the Pittsburgh Steelers um, have they been any bit uh, good on the road. And uh, outside of Nashville, they've been horrible, and they once again uh, did not produce in the 20-6 to loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Well, there you have it, folks. Week 10, the witching week of the NFL on the college football front. Woo! We went 7-1. and one. We're going to get into those games later uh, this week when we prep you for the weekend. But college is football coming down to it. We're going to have a really interesting look at what the college football playoff could possibly turn out to be. There is a real chance that a 12-1 and one SEC champion, Alabama, could not get in the playoff. Can you imagine that? Could the playoff actually do that? Committee do that? Well, if you look at the possibilities that exist, you're telling me a Big 12 Texas champ with one loss with a win over Alabama and Tuscaloosa doesn't get in over Alabama versus, let's say, a 12-1 and one, uh, Oregon uh, champion? We'll wait and see, but it should be very, very interesting. All right, when we come back, we'll preview the Monday Night Football matchup, get you ready, to, uh, get you ready for that matchup between the Bills and the Broncos on Monday Night Football. Welcome back, everybody, to The Straight Line with Ryan Leaf. Week 10 comes to a finish tonight with Monday Night Football. Uh, The Buffalo Bills host the Denver Broncos. A year ago at this time, heading into a bye week, the Denver Broncos were 3-5, and but with Nathaniel Hackett. There's a lot different vibe in Denver right now. Russell Wilson has 16 touchdowns for only four interceptions. This team is 3-4, and four, but they've won their last two games with wins over the Green Bay Packers and then the huge win over the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, it was a Chiefs team that had Patrick Mahomes uh, ailing with an illness, but still, uh, they had beat them for the first time since the Peyton Manning administration in Denver. So there's optimism. Uh, the defense is better. Better. They've gotten rid of Randy Gregory and Frank Clark, two guys that I, they thought were, were problems in that locker room, and the defense has shored itself up. They've limited teams from scoring points, and that's what they're going to need tonight from Buffalo, a team that is struggling offensively. They've generated 
you know, 24 points uh, against the, the Bucks, 18 points against the Bengals, only 14 points against the Giants. You see where this is going. Uh, they haven't been able to put up the points that they had earlier in the year where they put up 48 against the Dolphins in that dominating performance early in the year. Josh Allen was more Josh Allen uh, over the last couple of weeks, but you know the defense, which is still trying to find its footing because of all of the gut-wrenching injuries, the Matt Milano's, the da- uh, Daquan Jones, uh, the Whites on the back end. I mean, this this defense has been gutted, and they're trying to find their way. They um, traded for Rasul Douglas from the Green Bay Packers, who got some play a week ago. We'll see how that looks tonight in this matchup. Uh, the uh, you know spread has hung around uh, a, a touchdown. For most of the week, um, the total for me is is more up 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 the um, up my alley right now. Um, but if we're gonna go with the spread, we're gonna go uh, uh, just because, simply put, the games the Bills have played in over the last month have all been within a touchdown, and so that's why we're gonna go the Broncos plus seven. If you want to jack it to seven and a half, which I've done, Broncos plus seven and a half uh, in this matchup. Um, I think I think saves you uh, if Buffalo is able to find a way, and if not, uh, the Broncos find uh, um, a way to upset the Bills tonight in Buffalo. As for the total, uh, also it's been running close to that under. You know, there have been some overs, but they've been mostly pretty low. In the 30s is when they've been getting those over. 47 and a half right now. I like it. Let's go under the 47 and a half in this matchup. The Buffalo Bills win this game, 21 to 17 Uh, that is your win for the bills tonight let's go to our top prop for monday night football Uh, josh allen in the games that they've blown teams out has been under his pass attempt numbers games where it's been tight and they've had to keep fighting and playing throughout the game he's been over it and that usually leads into the the high 30s and the and, and the low 40s in terms of attempts so my Top prop for Monday Night Football is Josh Allen over 35 and a half pass attempts. Okay? Over 35 and a half pass attempts for Josh Allen in this matchup against the Denver Broncos. They just seemingly cannot run the football unless it's Josh Allen running the football. They hope to change that, but expect him to attempt a lot of passes tonight in this matchup. My Monday night same game parlay. We're going to go with that Allen over 35 and a half passing yards as well as the 47 and a half under and the Bills money line. If you can get that, take that for your same game parlay. Have fun. Enjoy. We'll be back Thursday to break down the Thursday night game, take you through some of the college matchups from uh, last week, as well as get uh, and dig deep into some of the NFL news from the week. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.